Tonight, let's talk about creation and evolution. There are two contrasting views about the origin of life and the universe. The Bible teaches that God created the world and all things in it in six literal days. Man teaches that all began from non-living matter and evolved into the present form. What man teaches, or what the Bible teaches, is the Genesis account of creation. What man teaches we refer to as the theory of evolution. And both, I want to suggest to you, are matters of faith. Roger Dixon, in his book, Fall of Unbelief, he said, as one examines the theory of evolution, he is suddenly struck with the thought that it demands more faith than does the creation account of Genesis 1. I say amen to that. When your evolutionary friends or your evolutionists tell you that what you believe is a matter of faith, you need to remind them that what they believe on the matter of evolution is likewise a matter of faith. In fact, it involves more faith to have the concept of evolution, as you'll see, than the Genesis account of creation. Evolution or creation by itself cannot be established by the scientific method that we talked about in our last study. Last time we talked about the Bible and science. Dr. Henry Morris, who's written much on creation and scientific creation, as he calls it, and the Genesis flood he, uh, and various aspects of the flood. If you see anything along the line on television about the discovery, the possible discovery of Noah's Ark, he will probably be interviewed and his material will be there. But Dr. Mars said this, he said, of all people, there is perhaps less reason for the scientist than any other to accept evolution. By its very nature, evolutionary history is beyond the reach of his scientific method, having to do with origins, with events of prehistoric past, which are non-repeatable and non-measurable. It is not within the scope of the scientific method. So I want to talk a little while this evening first about the evidence for creation. And then we'll talk about some of the problems with evolution. So we've got a lot of ground to cover. And I encourage you to pay close attention. If you would like copies of the material, I can supply that for you. If you can't copy everything down, which you will not be able to do. Let's talk about evidence for creation. The evidence that creation is true and that the account of creation is true is based upon the fact that God is. We spent two lessons in this series establishing the fact that God is. And those evidences still stand. So God is because, and I won't go back through the reasons, for the very reasons that we talked about in those two lessons. There is a God. So based on the fact that God is and He exists, which we have established, and we will establish more when we get to the resurrection of Christ, which I said is the heart of our study. There will be more evidence that there is a God. Based upon that, the creation account must be true. That means that the Bible story of the account of creation is true. The Word of God says that God created the world. There are 75 references, approximately, in the Old and New Testament to the creation account. It is not just Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, but there are 75 references in the Bible to the creation account. The Bible account says that God created the world. Jesus, who was proven to be the Son of God by His resurrection from the dead, Romans 1 and in verse 4, endorsed the Genesis account. In Matthew chapter 19, he endorsed the creation account in verses 3 through 6. He which made them at the beginning made them male and female. We'll see more about that in just a moment. So if I can show Jesus was raised from the dead, and I can, and we'll do that in another study, abundant evidence of the resurrection of Christ, then Jesus who was raised from the dead and proven to be deity endorsed the Genesis account. That tells me the Genesis account is true. Now the Genesis account is also true because there is a God that we've established in our first two studies. But I might add to that just quickly the fact that God, who not only created the world, He also governs and sustains all things, according to Colossians 1, Hebrews chapter 1, Acts 17. So not only did God create the world, He didn't sit back then and just let it run so that He has nothing to do with it, but He controls the entire universe and all things that are therein. Now God created all things in six literal days. So let's open our Bibles to Genesis chapter 1 and let's look at some accounts that are found in the Bible concerning the Genesis account of creation. In Genesis chapters 1 and 2, we have the six days that are laid out for us. We won't read each of those. I just want to summarize what took place in the six days of creation. Day 1 is described in Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 to 5. And in, on day 1, God created the world and He created light. 
Day two is described in verses six through eight. On day two, he divided the waters from the firmament. On day three, which is found in verses nine to 13, he divided the waters from the land and the grass and the trees and the plants were created. On day four, which is described in verses 14, down through verse 19, the stars and the sun and the moon were created. On day five, which is found in verses 20 through 23, we have God having created the birds and the sea creatures. On day six, which is found in verses 24 to 31, which brings us now to the end of chapter one, we have the cattle and we have beast and we have man. But I want you to notice something in every one of those days. Notice at verse five, the evening and the morning were the first day. At verse eight, the evening and the morning were the second day. And at verse 13, the evening and the morning were the third day, and I won't go through all of those, but each one of those in day one, two, three, four, five, and six, the evening and the morning were the first, second, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth day. I want to suggest to you that the term day has its ordinary meaning. Biblical hermeneutics suggest to us that ordinary meanings are what to be, is how a word is to be interpreted unless there is something in the context to demand otherwise. There is nothing else in the context to demand that a day mean anything other than what we think of as being a day, a 24-hour period. More about that in a moment. But secondly, I want you to notice the term day involved an evening and a morning. Morning and the evening were the first day. The morning and the evening were the second day. The morning and the evening were the third day. So here we have six literal days in which the world was created. Now let's give evidence from other texts that that is exactly what Genesis 1 is talking about. Now remember Jesus, who was raised from the dead, endorsed the Genesis 1 and 2 account and tells us that indeed he, he believed it to be true. So deity endorsed that account, so I know deity wrote Genesis 1 and 2. Let's go to Genesis chapter 5, and I want you to notice in Genesis chapter 5 that this is the book of genealogy of Adam in the day that God created man. The day that God created man. He created male and female and blessed them and called mankind in the day which they were created. And Adam lived 130 years and begot a son in his own likeness. In his image, he named him Seth. And he begot Seth, the, uh, and after he begot Seth, the days of Abraham were 800 years and he had sons and daughters. So all the days that Adam lived were 930 years and he died. Now let's raise some questions and some points about Genesis chapter 5 that we just underlined in Genesis chapter 5. Adam and Eve were created the same day. That is, it wasn't that they evolved somehow under theistic evolution so that you had one and then later in time, millions of years later, you have the female or the female first and then the male. God created man and woman the same day. There are two measures of time found in Genesis 5. There are the days and there are the years. Now the question is, are, are those literal days or non-literal days? Some say the days of Genesis 1, the days of creation, were millions of years in length. If you want to harmonize, and there are some who harmonize, try to harmonize uh, evolution with the concept of the Bible, and so they come up with theistic evolution. So are those days literal? Well, they, we're told they're not literal. Are the, are the years literal? So let's raise some questions about that. Was Adam literally 930 years old? Now, if the day stands for millions of years, then what would the years stand for? Billions and billions and billions of years. So, did Adam live billions and billions of years old? Do the evolutionists really believe that, the theistic evolutionists? How old, was, how old was creation at the point that Adam died? When Adam died, if, if a day is millions of years, then years must be billions and billions and billions of years. So, when Adam died, it was billions and billions and billions of years. So, how old is it now? We have problems with evolution in Genesis 5. Let's go to Exodus 20, verses 9 through 11. In Exodus 20, 9 through 11, six days you shall labor and do all your work. But in the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. Now we understand this is a literal week because he's talking about the week in the Jewish life. That they were to work six days and the Sabbath day was the day that they were to observe. Now in verse 11, for in six days... The Lord made the heavens and the earth and the sea. Now I want you to notice what we just learned from Exodus chapter 20. It's not just that living things of the earth were created in six days, but also the heavens and the earth and the seas were created in those six days. 
I want you to notice that the seven days of creation were parallel to the seven days of a normal work week for Israel. So I learned from Exodus 20 to interpret Genesis 1 as literally six days of creation. I learned that from Exodus chapter 20. Here we have a divine commentary on Genesis 1 and 2 that creation took place in six literal days. I know the creation account is true because Jesus endorsed it, Matthew 19. And I know that there is a God, and I learned from that that this was six literal days. So I believe that indeed with all of my heart. Exodus 31, same point to be made. Work shall be done for six days, but the seventh is the Sabbath of rest. In the interest of time, I want to drop down to verse 17. That it shall be a sign between you and Israel forever, for in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. Now what did I learn from Exodus 31? What I learned from Exodus 31, the seven days of creation were parallel to the seven days of a week, normal work week for Israel. So I learned they're parallel. The, the comparison is made in Exodus 31. So I learned from that that in six days God made the heavens and the earth. Not just made some things, but the heavens and the earth were made within six days. So again, we have a divine commentary on Genesis 1 and 2 that creation took place in six literal days. If you're not familiar with Psalm 33, you need to get familiar with Psalm 33 when it comes to creation. You want to you argue with a theistic evolutionist, you need to know Psalm 33. You need to understand what Psalm 33 is saying. Psalm 33 beginning at verse 6. Psalm 33, a twin psalm, by the way, to the next psalm, Psalm 34. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. He gathered us the water and the sea together as a heap. He lays up the storehouses. Let all the earth fear before the Lord, and let the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. Now notice verse 9, and you might underline. For he spoke it, and it was done. He commanded, and it stood fast. Now what did we just learn from Psalm 33? I learned that God spoke it, it was done, and it stood fast. This was an instantaneous creation. It didn't take billions of years to stabilize. The, the evolutionist, the atheistic evolutionist says that God was not involved at all. There is no God. The theistic evolutionist says God created with a big bang all of the earth and the world. I mean, the created the world uh, with a big bang. And it took billions of years for it to stabilize in their terms. Psalm 33, which by the way is in, in uh, Psalms, uh, is the book of Psalms is endorsed by Jesus, who was raised from the dead, says it was instantaneous and it didn't take billions of years. Now when God spoke it, it was done, not that it begun. It wasn't a beginning process when God spoke it, it was done. God spoke it, it was done. Here again we have a divine commentary on Genesis 1 and 2, the creation was indeed instantaneous. Let's go to another passage, Hebrews chapter 4 and in verse 3. The text says, for we who have believed do enter into the rest, as he has said, so I enter my rest, that you may enter, may not, uh, they shall not enter my rest, although the works were, now no, notice, finished from the foundation of the world. The works were finished from the foundation of the world. What did we learn from Hebrews chapter 4? I learned that the work of creation was finished at the foundation of the world. It didn't begin, but it was finished, it was completed. If God began his work at the foundation, then finished it billions of years later, as theistic evolution says, then this passage is not true and we have to throw the whole book of Hebrews out. Now, the divine commentary again on Genesis 1 and 2, that creation was completed in a short time. It did not take long for creation to take place. Remember that evolution has to have a lot of time. Creation doesn't have to have a lot of time. But evolution demands lots and lots and lots of time. Now let's go to where Jesus endorsed this creation account in Matthew chapter 19 and also in Mark chapter 10. Matthew chapter 19, he answered and said unto them, Have you not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female? He that made them at the beginning made them male and female. Now Mark's account says much the same thing, that from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. From the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. Now what did we learn from those two passages about creation? What we learn is God made male and female. God made male and female at the same time. We also learned that man, created, man was created at the beginning of creation. 
And we also learn that if billions of years took place as per theistic evolution, man was created closer to our time than at the beginning. Get this point. When you talk to a theistic evolutionist, and some of our own brethren a few years ago said, here's the way we harmonize what the, the billions of years we have to have, millions of years, is that each one of these days represents millions of years, and, and man was created down here on the sixth day. And we're now living in the seventh day, some of our own brethren were saying. Others said, oh, no, no, no. Day one is, is 24-hour period. Day two is a 24-hour period. But it's separated by millions of years. If that's the case, if we put all of that amount of time in Genesis 1 and 2, then God created man closer to our time now, the seventh day which we're in, they tell us, than at the beginning. That being the case, then Jesus was wrong. But Jesus wasn't wrong. Jesus was proved to be the Son of God by the resurrection from the dead, and Jesus said He made them at the beginning. So these are not billions of millions of years, nor are they separated by millions of years. It's trying to give you some idea of refuting theistic evolution as well as the, the general concept of evolution. So when we come to the G creation account of Genesis chapter 1, the question is, is this a literal or non-literal account in Genesis chapter 1? What we saw in every one of these passages, we saw Genesis 1, 5, Exodus 20, Exodus 31, Psalm 33, Hebrews 4, Matthew 19, Mark 10, all argue for the fact that there is a literal six-day account of creation. But let's go a step further. Let's argue for the fact that we've seen the fact that God is, says, that there is the idea of creation. We've also shown that he created all things in six literal days. The evidence of a relatively young earth argues for creation. When it comes to the age of the earth, there's all kinds of ideas across the whole spectrum. The evolutionists will not give an exact time, but they'll tell us either millions and millions. Carl Sagan would say it need to be billions and billions of years. There are some creationists who will say that they know exactly how old the earth is. They can tell you the, the year that the world was created and even the day on which you, the month and the day on which it was created. Both are extremes. We don't know exactly how old the earth is. But I argue for a relatively young earth. We're safer doing that than saying it is 6,000 years old or 7,000 years old. To take a chronology of the Bible is not the intended purpose of that and add all the years up. Because it doesn't work out. You just try that and, and see if that works and you'll come up with different numbers. That was not designed to give us an exact account of the, the days of creation. But the Bible argues for a relatively young earth, if the creation account be true. So let's talk about the evidence for a relatively young earth. If the earth is young, thousands of years old, and not billions or millions of years old, then there's not enough time for evolution. So if we can show some evidence that the earth is relatively young, that harmonizes with creation account and not evolution. Let's see. Time makes all the difference. R.L. Wysong said, in creation and evolution controversy, both evolutionists and creationists believe evolution is an impossibility if the universe is only a few thousand years old. Both agree to that. There's probably no statement that would gain, be made on the topic of origins that would meet with so much agreement from both sides. Setting aside the question of whether vast time is competent to propel evolution, we must query if vast time is indeed available. Amen and amen. Did you catch what he said? Well, we've, well, we've got, everybody agrees. The creationists and the evolution say that we, we all agree there has to be a lot, a lot, a lot of time for evolution to work. There has to be billions of years for it to work. But what we need to be asking the question, is that time available? Is it available or not? Dr. Thompson said, in Reason and Revelation, he said, time makes all the difference. It is interesting to observe how something on which both sides agree has caused so much disagreement. Aside from the basic issue of whether creation or evolution is correct, the most serious area of conflict between biblical and the evolutionary scenarios is the chron chronological framework of history. In other words, the age of the earth. While a young earth presents no problem whatsoever for creationists, it is a death knell to each and every variety of evolutionary scenario. It's a death knell to the atheistic evolutionist and the theistic evolutionist as well. Let's talk about some evidence that the earth is not billions of years or even millions of years old. Obviously, not being a scientist, I will only quote from those who are. This is interesting. Walter T. Brown, Jr., 
Dr. Brown. From the Institute for Creation Research, or they published in March of 1981, a paper that, an article started out as an article and then later published as a booklet, Evidence That Implies a Young Earth in the Solar System. Uh, graduate of MIT, he was a former evolutionist, by the way. And from his studies about the age of the Earth, he began to believe that there's not enough time for evolution to work. So he gave up his theory of evolution and became a creationist. And he said this, he said, actually most dating techniques show that the Earth and the solar system are young, usually less than 10,000 years old. That's not enough time for evolution. Let's double that. And now we have 20,000 years. That's still not enough time. Let's multiply it by 10. Let's have 100,000. We still don't have enough time. A million years isn't enough time. The evolutionist needs billions of years for it to work. Now, here are some of his evidences. That is, and Brother King, who's going to be with us, wrote a book on the booklet on the days of creation. He quotes from Dr. Brown. And so I'll run through these quickly just to give you kind of a concept that there is evidence for a relatively young Earth. He talks about the atomic clock, which measures the Earth's spin rate. The nearly a billionth of a second have consistently found that the Earth is slowing down at the rate of almost a second a year. That doesn't seem like much. But he goes on to argue that if the Earth was billions of years old, the initial spin rate would have been fantastically rapid. So rapid, so argues Brown, that major distortions in the shape of the Earth would have occurred. He argues for a relatively young Earth, not billions of years. He argues from the vantage point of the Earth's magnetic field. That is, the measurements of the Earth's magnetic field since 19, or 1835 has showed a steady rapid uh, decline in its strength. And so physicists like Horace Lamb and Dr. Thomas Barnes, who are quoted frequently, if you read about evolution, you'll see their names appear frequently. They've examined the, the depletion of the Earth's magnetic field and have shown that given the rate of depletion, the Earth cannot be older than 10,000 years in age. If this view is correct, then 25,000 years ago, the electronic electrical current may have been so vast in the Earth's structure that it could not have survived the heat that would be produced, so argued Dr. Brown. Well, there's another evidence. He's talked about the helium production. The atmosphere of the helium uh, is less than 40,000 years worth of helium based on the production of helium from the decay of uranium and thorium. And he said there is no known means by which large amounts of helium can escape from the atmosphere. If the present rate of accumulation had been constant throughout 4 billion years of the Earth's history, there would be 30 times as much helium in our present atmosphere as it presently is. The atmosphere, therefore, appears to be, to be young, he argues. Now, throughout all these quotations I'm giving, if you want copies of this, the documentation that Brown himself uses um, to talk about that. The cosmic dust is another evidence for a relatively young Earth. The rate of uh, the dust that accumulates from the, earth, from, from the space on the Earth, he says, is such that after five billion years, the equivalent of 182 feet of dust should, be, should have accumulated. He goes on to point out, Dr. Brown points out, that because of the dust is high in nickel, there should be an exceedingly large amount of nickel in, the, in the, the rocks of the earth, in the crustal rocks of the earth. But there's no concentration found in the land or the oceans, and consequently the earth appears to be young. He quotes Dr. Morris, who we've already considered. He talks about the comets boil off. These are just a summary of a few. Uh, Brother King, in his work on the creation, lists 20-something of these, and I'm only listing five or six. That there are short periods of comet boil off, as he calls them, where some of the masses each time of, of these comets as they pass by the sun, nothing should remain of these comets after about 10,000 years. And he said there are no known sources of replenishing comets, and if the comets came into existence at the same time the solar system, the solar system must be, must be less than 10,000 years old. And he gives his documentation thereof. Well, let's shift scholars for a moment. Um, many of you may know Josh Gutler, Dr. J Gutler, a member, a faithful member of the church wrote a little work called Unraveling Evolution. He talks about the evidence for a young earth from the vantage point of the contemporary rapid sedimentation. Uniformitarianism, he said, says that millions of years are needed to produce sedimentation that we see in the geological column. And then I quote from, from uh, Dr. Gutler, he said, some sedimentary layers uh, some of the sedimentary layers, they supposedly were created millions of years apart, are often interbedded within one another. Now, this is interesting. 
One example of this shows the Cambrian and the Mississippian sedimentary layers embedded one on top of the other. The only problem is that the Cambrian layers are allegedly laid down over 150 million years before the Mississippian layers. How did that happen, that the Cambrian layer came out up on top? Here's an example of that. This is on the, the Grand Canyon walls. And the picture shows, if you can tell, the different colored layers of the Mississippian interbedded with the Cambrian layers, and there's one right on top of the other. And yet one of those was supposed to be 150 million years before the other. What would explain that? Maybe a flood, like of Genesis 6? But the flood didn't happen, though, if evolution be true. That didn't happen. That didn't occur. The flood's going to explain a lot. That's why we're talking about the flood. That's not just an interesting story. It tells us a lot about what happened to, for example, dinosaurs. We'll talk about the flood next time. Dr. Cutler also talks about the rapid sedimentation. Evidence shows that the sedimentary levels of the geologic, ge geologic column were formed rapidly rather than slowly. Evolution says that happened very slowly. So you have this layer, and the next layer was 150 million years later, and then millions of years later, here's another layer, and then here's another layer millions of years later. Slowly. But he said the evidence shows it seems to be something that was um, rather quickly. One of his evidences is, he said, rocks hold dinosaur fossils, contain only dinosaurs and not the vegeta vegetation necessary to sustain life. Why? That's interesting. Where was all of their food? A full-grown apatosaurus would require over three tons of vegetation per day. Why are the dinosaurs buried absent of their surrounding ecosystem? He said, could this be evidence of a catastrophic burial, like maybe a flood? He answers, yes. Another evidence he sets is, or gives is that trees are set in several layers of sedimentation as evidence of rapid sedimentation. One example is found right here in our state. This was in Cookville, Tennessee. There were several trees that were found in the Kettles coal mine that was supposedly, according to the uh, evolutionists, buried gradually. And these layers were that this tree is setting here, and then here's a layer, and then another layer would be millions of years later that sediment be begins to build up, and the tree keeps standing while it takes millions of years for that all to build up, according to the evolutionists. And he said only a rapid, only a rapid sedimentation could explain what happens with reference to this tree. Now what's interesting about this tree is, some of our brethren took this picture over in uh, uh, Cookville, this tr tree begins in one coal seam, and it protrudes upward through several layers and then into another coal seam, which our evolutionists would say that happened millions and millions of years, but the tree went all the way through. And that's just one of several that were found right over here at Cookville, Tennessee. That's interesting. That argues for a young earth. Another evidence that Dr. Gutler argues for a relatively young earth is a distance from the moon to the earth. He said the moon is receding from the earth at the rate of an uh, inch and a half per year. However, if the earth was in the order of five million years old, then the moon would be at least three and a half t times further from the earth than it is presently. That argues, along with the other four, a relatively young earth. Now, let's draw some conclusions from that, and then we'll talk about evolution. What do we conclude from all of that? That creation took place in a very short process of time. Creation took place and a relatively short process of time. Six days, according to Genesis 1. But even if we throw Genesis 1 and 2 out, the evidence of a relatively young earth doesn't allow for the millions and billions of years that we need to talk about for there to be evolution. Creation was at the command of God. Fiat creation, not a gradual thing. God spoke it and it was done. Thirdly, the first plants and the first animals and man were full grown. That can't happen in, in, in evolution. Suddenly there wasn't a man that appeared. But he started from a single cell and began to evolve until he's a, a more complex creature, until finally you have man down the line millions of years later. But according to the creation account, when God created the plant life, when he created animal life, when he created man, they were full grown. Fourthly, animals and plants reproduce after their kind. We'll talk more about that in the second part of the study. Animals and plants reproduce after their kind. Furthermore, there was one original man. If evolution be true, that wouldn't be the case. Because all across the globe, 
There would be, if, if this cell could develop into finally some animal that becomes a monkey and then becomes an ape and then becomes a Java man and becomes some other kind of man and then it finally becomes humans as we know it, then why wasn't a cell doing that somewhere else? And so there may be several men begin to be uh, evolving. But according to the creation account, there was one original man. Woman came from the rib of man. How would the evolutionists explain where did the man come from and where did the, the female come from? They had to evolve somehow, but the biblical account said God created woman from the rib of man. And finally, man sinned and he fell and he needed redemption. And thus the creation account points us to the direction of a need for a savior, but evolution takes us away from that. Now, we're going to stop there. I have more material on evolution. We're going to get to that next week because... To rush through that at this point will not do justice to that. We'll put that material with our, our uh, material on the flood. We'll talk about the flood next time, but we'll talk about the, the, the problems with evolution. And um, rather than take the time, uh, the time is gone, and if we take more time, it's, I'm going to rush through that. So we're going to stop at that juncture. And we'll talk about evolution next time, but that's what the Bible says about creation. So what have we seen about creation? That there is the Genesis account of Genesis 1 and 2. So what do you take home with you? Well, here's the Genesis account of, of 1 and 2. And in this Genesis account of 1 and 2, what we have is based upon the concept that there is a God, as we talked about a moment ago, the fact that there is a God, that tells us that indeed, since there is a God, then the creation account is true. We gave abundant evidence of that. The creation account says that God created all things in six literal days. There is evidence for a relatively young earth which says that that agrees with the creation account rather than the evolutionary model. And then we have to draw these conclusions that we just came from. And therefore we can believe with all of our hearts since Jesus was raised from the dead, we'll give more evidence of that later, and he endorsed this account that indeed this account of creation indeed is true. And indeed Jesus is the Son of God in the creation account indeed is true. Next time we'll talk about the contrasting problems with evolution. What are the problems with that? We'll come back to some of the dating methods. And what can we say about uh, carbon-14 dating and some of those methods? And, and are they true? And are they reliable? And we'll talk about some evidences that they are not reliable as the, the scientists have so told us they are. We'll get to that in our next study. There may be one more present who's not a Christian, who's not a child of God. Would you come believing that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God? Would you repent of your sins, acknowledge your faith in Christ, and be buried in the waters of baptism for the remission of sins? If you're subject in any way, would you come while together we stand and while we sing?